Welcome. This is the Lifetime Cash Flow through Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is where you'll learn strategies to help you achieve lifetime financial freedom through real estate investment. Your host, Rod Cleef, has owned over 2,000 homes and apartments, and he brings experts in all aspects of real estate investment and management onto the show. Now, here's your host, Rod Cleef. Welcome to Lifetime Cash Flow through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef, and I'm thrilled you're here. And I know you guys are really going to enjoy the two gentlemen we're interviewing today. I had done one of my free 30-minute phone calls with one of them and was so impressed with their work ethic and what they've done already at their young age. They're both in their 20s and, and they're about to close on their first 24-unit deal. I mean, you guys, I know you, you, you've heard me interview people with a few hundred units to a few thousand units to tens of thousands of units, but people like these two gentlemen will relate to many of you much more because they're just really getting going in the multifamily space. They've been bitten by the multifamily bug. And I'm real excited to uh, have them tell you their story because I, I was really impressed and I think you will be as well. So their names are uh, Dylan Borland and David Tupin. Guys, welcome to the show. Thanks, Rod. Thanks, Rod, for having us. Absolutely. So Dylan, let's start with you. Tell us how you got started in business in general and then in real estate. And I, and, and make sure you tell people how old you were when you got started, because <laughs> that kind of blew me away as well. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. So uh, I'll try to keep it as short as possible, but um, I, I started at a very young age um, in business, just out of necessity. Um, I realized that um, uh, if I wanted to provide for myself, if I wanted to buy a car when I was 16, if I wanted to buy clothes, if I had to eat, quite frankly, um, I was the only person kind of a lone wolf. Uh, I was the only person that was going to be able to do it for myself. Um, my parents were divorced growing up and uh, my mom was working two jobs just to pay for the house. And so if it, it, it was up to me. So um, I started um, at the age of 13, actually flipping cars. Uh, and the reason why I got into that was because my neighbor um, was always working on cars in his garage and he'd fix one up, put on his lawn and sell it. And I got into it, not with the idea of wanting to fix and flip cars, but I got into it because I knew when I was 16, I didn't have money to pay a mechanic to fix my car uh, when I eventually bought a car. So anyways, I got the car fixing bug and I started going out the auctions and we bought a car together, fixed it, flipped it. And um, from about the age of 13 to 17, I spent uh, some time um, fixing and flipping cars. But for me, Rod, that wasn't enough because um, I had very specific income goals in mind. And I'd have to flip a lot of cars to get there. Uh, so I actually read a book on real estate investing when I was 17. And I said, ah, that's it. That, that's what I want to do. That's the business that's going to get me to the income goals. That do you I remember what on. book it was? It was. It was actually Trump Real Estate 101. <laughs> I <laughs> so, love it. I have, all, I have all of Mr. President Trump's now <laughs> uh, books. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. All right. Continue. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. So, um, so I read that book and I was just really inspired. I said, you know, real estate, as far as I could tell, real estate was the only business where I could get to build the type of income that I had envisioned for myself and the lifestyle that I wanted for myself. And so I actually ended up buying my first property when I was 17 and I couldn't even legally buy it at the time. I had to have my girlfriend buy it cause she was 18. Um, it. but it was, it was behind the house where I grew up. Um, and this was 2006, Rod. And uh, we, we renovated it and um, flipped it. And I did very, very well. But then shortly after that, um, the market crashed, as we all know. And I think that the Detroit market with the automotive industry got hit a little sooner than the rest of the nation. Um, so I was quickly having to figure out then, now what do I do? So that's kind of a quick you know, okay. synopsis of to, but, but to since where then, I was at. But since then, since then let's yeah. talk about what you've done since then, because that's most impressive. Yeah, so I've been investing now all in full time since 2006. Um, uh, I've been, God, what is it, 11 years already. Uh, my business, Rod, has really been primarily focused on residential fix and flips. And from about 2006 to 2010, while the market was declining and recovering, I had bought, um, my focus was on buying income rental properties. So I had accumulated actually 108 single family um, rental properties. Um, up until 2010. After 2010, to make a long story short, um, I ended up going through um, a divorce mm -hmm. and I had to liquidate those properties. And so I took about a year off from 2010, 2011 to kind of get my thoughts back together, jumped back into real estate full time, trying to recover from um, that personal hiccup 
um, I went in and focused on fix and flipping single families exclusively so I could keep my capital moving. I could rotate it about three times a year at 20 to 30% returns. Okay. So I, I got to a point very quickly where I was doing over 100 fix and flips properties a year from 2011 to just about November, well, not just about, exactly mm -hmm. November 2016. Um, where then we decided to move into the multifamily game, which is how we got introduced uh, to you and your material as well. Awesome. So uh, I've awesome. done a few things in between that time frame, a couple of one offer opportunities, which I, I think you probably um, are aware of as well, but uh, that's where we're at now. No, that's awesome. And, I, and yeah. I, you know, it's so funny. I can totally relate to starting to do business when you were 14. I, I lied about my age and got a job at Burger King so I could buy my yeah, first my first car, my 70 Roadrunner. I had this nice. cool 70 Roadrunner with this pistol grip shifter and it had a hood scoop. You put, It was called an air grabber. You flick a switch and a hood scoop comes out of the hood you know, electronically. Yeah, that was, that was, uh, oh, that's nice. that, yeah, that was awesome. But I don't, I had to go and work at Burger King and flip yeah. burgers uh, for, for a so couple of years. So you weren't flipping years. cars, but you were flipping no, burgers. Exactly. Flipping no, exactly. No, so you, you, you got, you're a lot smarter than I was. So, okay, well, uh, David, uh, you're up. So tell us about your, your background and how yeah, you got absolutely. started. So, so I guess I kind of have a similar story starting at a young age, um, 13 years old. My parents told me, I've always been a huge car guy, kind of like, okay. I guess, Dylan. I never got into flipping them, but, uh, you know, I knew when I turned 16, I wanted to buy a car. And my parents said, uh, you know, you bring us X amount of money and we'll, we'll match it up to like three or 4,000 bucks uh, and you can buy a car on your 16th birthday. And uh, uh, so I started a, a landscaping business. I didn't want to do what everyone else was doing. Um, everyone else was kind of doing, you know, going to working at the fast food places or, you know, working for minimum wage. I wanted to... I wanted to. Oh, sure. You had to throw that in there <laughs> after my story, in didn't you? <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, that's brutal, man. Um, no, but, but, but I really, uh, you know, saw myself, you know, doing something else. And I didn't really like working for, for other people necessarily. I like working for myself. So I started a landscaping business and throughout high school, by the time I was 17 or 18, I had accumulated probably about $10,000 worth of equipment. Um, you know, 50 plus clients. I was mowing lawns, doing landscaping every week, and I accumulated quite a bit of money um, uh, doing that. And I sold that off when I went to college. And okay. then I got, uh, yeah, so then, uh, you know, since then, I, I uh, my first three years in college, um, I actually went to uh, initially go into dental, uh, the dental program. Uh, my, dad's, my dad's a dentist, so I thought I always wanted to be a dentist at that point. Um, it quickly changed my mind. Um, decided business was for me. My junior year, uh, I had done an internship in uh, auditing. I, I then did one in investment banking and consulting. And um, in the meantime, while I was doing those, I had read a book. Uh, uh, you know it. I'm sure almost all of your readers know it, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Of course. And, uh, you know, it's cliche, but that book blew my mind, completely got me hooked on real estate. Um, funny story. You had, I believe, Eric Stark last week mm -hmm. uh, is what you aired. Right. His partner, his partner Steve Mills, uh, I had heard on Bigger Pockets quite a while ago, about a, hmm. about a year ago, and Steve Mills had mentioned, uh, you know, he's from Royal Oak, Michigan, right where close to where we are, and he had he had said, "Go read Rich Dad Poor Dad on the podcast." That's what got me into it. Steve Steve Mills no was actually kidding. a catalyst. Yes, that's oh, why you had his partner on the show. That's, and Steve that's actually funny. then became my first my first mentor for a awesome. few months. He he really mentored me and got me into. Uh, real estate. Those guys are great. Steve and Eric, they do a great job. Um, awesome. Yeah. So, so from there, I, I actually uh, got out of my last internship and decided that working in the corporate world was not for me. Um, you know, I, I had some big job offers and literally the day I got out of my last internship, I turned them all down. And I, yeah, I think uh, you wrote down, you were offered like 80 grand, which is pretty yeah, significant starting yeah, salary and you for, turned it down. For Michigan. Yeah. For right. Michigan, you know, um, uh, and, and I turned it down the day after I got out because I knew I had, like Dylan, I had very specific income goals. And I knew I wasn't going to hit it uh, by working for someone else. I knew that was only going to come by working oh, for myself. Good for um, you. I'm yeah. sure that was a challenging decision because, you know, very when you're facing that, that kind of salary uh, in one hand, <laughs> the bird in the hand versus, you know, a, a dream and a goal. Exactly. That's, that says a lot about, you know, your, yeah. your goal setting and, and uh, the power of, of yeah. Uh, of, you know, you setting your own goals and realizing yeah, you know, what you really wanted. I know a lot of people are in that same scenario. And I'd say for me, it was easy because, I, you know, I didn't really have much to lose. I'm not, I don't have a ton of, uh, 
costs, expenses to live. I don't have a family to support. I know it's a different decision when you're at that point, but but for me, um, you know, it, it was kind of a no-brainer. If I if I you know if I take that leap now, I'm really not missing out on too much. I could always go back and maybe try you know try for this. So that's again. how you justified it because you you were like <laughs> but it was you know never, what? <laughs> but I, I had nothing to lose at the point. But but right. in my head, I was never going back. I, I never wanted to 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 you know take that second option. My first my first and only option was to to make it, and, and real estate was the. The thing so awesome was, and it's it, I, read, yeah. I read here that you did your first wholesale deal um and uh made 12 grand and for those of you who don't know what wholesaling means it's basically finding a deal and getting it under contract and then flipping mm -hmm. the contract so you made 12 grand which is a pretty respectable wholesale deal yeah uh, so that was that was about within a first the, you know the first month of of me uh you know declining those job offers and going out on my own in real estate and uh, within that time i had met dylan uh, a few weeks in and uh, through a mutual friend, and I, I had heard about him and a lot of the cool things he'd been doing throughout the community. He's kind of a, he's kind of a rock star as far as fix and flip goes in the single family community. So um, I had a meeting with him, latched onto him pretty quick. Got in, you know, uh, he took me took me in under his wing, uh, kind of in a mentor relationship. I forced him. So for, right. He forced me. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. Good. Well, so, good. And um, I, I know you did some you did some flips after that to, together with uh, Dylan and and correct. Uh, yeah. so got, he, got acclimated. Yeah, so he brought me he brought me in under his wing, and, and a few weeks into coaching, uh, Dylan actually kind of said, "Hey, you're not you're not <laughs> uh, you you can tell it best. You say it best." Well, yeah. So David originally s sought me out to coach him because I do some coaching in, in, as well. On, um, I, I have a small amount of coaching clients that I work with, and and mm -hmm. uh, I, I knew very quickly David was the exception to a lot of the rules. And uh, I could tell that he was somebody who I needed to pull out of coaching pretty quickly and get him on board with me. Oh, wow. um, and uh, well, once that's I did a, that's, that, that's, that's uh, nice of nice, nice to hear that. Right, David. <laughs> once awesome. I did that, um, he absolutely, you know, killed it. And uh, he closed his first deal uh, the first week and uh, did a deal a week after. Then he said, I was done with the residential game. It's too small for me. Yeah, and basically. he's actually uh, the reason. I had done two multifamily deals prior to meeting David, but I, was, I got very complacent in the residential business. Sure. Um, which oh, I, I can totally relate. I mean, yeah. you know, it totally, you get comfortable because it's so yeah. easy. I mean, yeah. you know, when you become good at it, it's so yeah. easy. And, and right. from, you know, for me, buying a house is like buying yeah. a pair of socks, you right. know, it's just so yeah. simple. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and you're right. Complacence is a great word because that's the reason that I got my butt kicked because I didn't yeah. get out of single family as I was told to and get into multifamily in a bigger yeah. way. Uh, yeah. and, good. And David was really the catalyst for that. He helped me. Right, just, good. I mean, focus on on multifamily 100 percent. that was back in in november of this uh 2016 so awesome yep. awesome well so let's talk about this first uh well not first but but the deal that you've got on the table right now it's if i understand it correctly it's 212 units correct yep, yep. <laughs> all right so tell us how you sourced it and uh tell us about it go ahead Dave. yeah so we found uh, actually both of them are through uh local multifamily brokers and uh, they're actually com uh, competitors, the, the two brokers, but uh, one had a listed one, I think Dylan found it uh, online, and the other one I had a kind of a relationship beforehand, and he sent it to me. They're actually two blocks from each other on the same street. Perfect. And, yeah, they're, they're great, and, and one is a 12-unit uh, of all sing uh, one bedroom, mm -hmm. um, one bedroom units, and the other one is all two bedroom units, and the great thing was we got them very similarly priced but the the the, uh, the one with two bedroom units had the same rents as the one, the one bedroom units. So nice. we knew instantly that you know buying nice. at the same price, we can we can increase the two bedroom unit rents yeah. at least a hundred a month each. Yep. Right. Yeah, you know, as is kind of poorly managed and but both definitely like like you teach Rod, both um, value add opportunities. Uh, one of the units in particular, they're both on a street called Pardo, and um, like David had mentioned, they're two blocks down from each other. Um, one of the units, the guy's owned it for like 48 years and he hasn't raised the, the rents are like a hundred to 150 below <laughs> where they should be. I mean, he's, right. he hasn't raised the rents on anybody, some people in 18 years. Wow. So, and, but he's taken, you know, it's immaculate, immaculate care of the property. I mean, anytime oh, there was great. even a little crack in the sidewalk, you'd be out there with a little caulk gun and, and fill okay. the crack in. So, nice. so very good. Uh, <laughs> both of them, very good opportunities. What caliber of an area, B area, C area, D area? Uh, I'd say C, C plus. Okay. C yeah. plus area. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, a, it's in a, it's just it's in Metro Detroit area, and it's a nice little kind of um, what would you say a, bl a blue collar kind of working area. Yeah. Okay. Um, well populated, mm -hmm. just outside of this area has a little downtown. So it's, it's not the hood. Just I mean, you yeah. hear stories no, no, about no, no, Detroit, no. That, yeah. you know, yeah. a little hair raising. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. The numbers, what are you paying and what do you anticipate as far as returns? If, you, if that's something you can come off yeah. the cuff with. Yeah. yeah. So I think what we, what we shoot for anytime uh, from here on out when we're, when we're putting a deal together is um, we mostly aim for what our investor is going to get. And then we look at our, our piece of the cut. So one of these, um, we syndicated and the other one we bought for uh, ourselves. So okay. the one we syndicated, we we do kind of like an 8% preferred return and then a split on the back end of that. Uh, you know, was, I think it was, what was that, 80-20? Yep, 80-20. And we, yep. and we aim to uh, to get our investors at least 10 to 12% is what is what we shoot for uh, from here going forward. Right. Okay. And with these properties as well. So yeah, so like David had mentioned, uh, both of these properties, we, one of them we bought for 567,000, one was 565,000. Okay. Uh, when we purchase the properties, what, what we look for is a is an overall 15% cash and cash return. Um, First and year. Obviously, yeah, and obviously it's leverage. So we'll, we'll usually model out at a 70% or 75% LTV. Um, because we don't have very good, my, my business was always cash based for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, we, we didn't have very good banking relationships. So I think we got hit harder than we should have on the, on the banking terms. Okay. But um, they're, they're amortized over 20 years and we had a fight for that. Some banks wanted okay. 15 year amortization and then 5% interest. So what that means is when we modeled the performer out on the back end, like David was mentioning, um, one I bought for myself, the other one we syndicated. On the syndication model, the investors are getting an 8% preferred. Right. And then um, they're going to fall somewhere between 10 to 12%. Obviously, you know, if everything goes right, we're very conservative on the performa. Uh, both buildings are currently 100% occupied, but when we modeled it out and sold the one on a syndication model, we modeled that at a 92% occupancy and sold that to investors. Um, and then, of course, we get, and I think your listeners are probably familiar with a portion of that back end, and our cut is a 20% split in addition to property management fees. And then we also charge uh, 1%. Acquisition fee? Uh, did you do an yeah. acquisition fee as well? Acquisition fee three, as well, 3%. 3%. Yeah. Okay. Fee and a 1% yeah. asset. 1% um, asset management fee yearly on gross income. Uh, I think we did 4% management fee 4 on that one. Fee, property yeah. management fee, because we do have our own brokerage as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, and then 20% uh, uh, equity. Equity. Right no, that's, that's great. And there's, yeah. there's lots of ways, guys, that you can structure these syndications. The way they did it was really more fee driven. In mine, I, I actually carved the equity 50 50 and, and just hardly take mm -hmm. any fees. So there's lots of ways. I mean, sure. the fee income is fantastic. You know, when you're mm -hmm. out there doing the due diligence and paying for third party reports and spending your own money to evaluate these properties, right. those fees can really make a big difference. And, and three to 5% is 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 the norm for acquisition fees so you have yeah. no problem charging yeah. those and on you know that can be a significant chunk uh to help you find the next deal so yep. mm -hmm. that's a great model all right yeah. fantastic you, you always talk about uh and i know you know, we might get into this later but you always say tell me about a deal where you got your butt kicked on and initially we went we went <laughs> into these planning uh you know we we thought we were going to get an 80 percent ltv from the bank and a 30-year amp we went in way you know not nearly conservatively enough on, on, yeah. uh, Let on me ask you this. Do you have a balloon? Uh, is it so it's a five-year term. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So because, because our business was, you know, cash-based for years past, uh, you know, we don't have, we didn't have those banking relationships and we went in expecting to get much better terms. And that's why we had to adjust the equity on the back end. Well, it's a little late for this conversation, but I do want to tell you guys, I would avoid five-year balloons right now, okay? Yeah. And because yeah. when the contraction happens, and it's mm -hmm. going to happen, yep. if you're at the trough yep. when it happens and your values have gone down, and even if you're cash flowing, you can't refinance, that is mm -hmm. no fun. Uh, so, right. so keep that in mind. Uh, in future deals, I would, I would push them out at least seven years right now. So, years. yeah. Yep. Yep, but, we agree. We felt yeah. with this, these properties, there's enough value to add. That, well, I think you're probably uh, right, and you, you know, uh, you may and not want to wait. Yeah. You may not want to wait to to to. Uh, to you may, maybe in a year you refi yeah. and and yeah. and just get yourself terms that are a little more palatable because yep. I would be a little bit nervous. I mean, not not not. I'm not trying to scare you. No, all. we understand just, completely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Fantastic. But they, they sound like great. I mean, those rents sound fantastic. Now, let me ask you this: Are you going to start pushing the rents? Are you going to start putting bringing them up? 
right away. Yeah, okay, yeah, so what whole. are you going to do to minimize vacancy? What is your plan? Do you have a plan for, for, yes. for raising the rents? I mean, you're not just going to go in and raise the rents a hundred bucks and not do anything, I hope. Correct. No, okay. I think, I think well, a majority of the tenants on both these properties are month to month. So I think okay. it'll be, it'll be pretty easy right away to go in and, and I, I think our goal is going to be to incrementally raise them. We're not going to raise them a hundred, 150 bucks if, if we can, you know, right. if we can retain some tenants and maybe do it over a year or two, incrementally raise them. Right. That okay. would be the best solution. Well, that's one strategy. Of, Another strategy yeah. is to go in and make some, some improvements and then, and then right. go to, go to just under market rent. Yep. Um, so you know, but, but you, you know, obviously you want to be careful that you don't end up with a ton of vacancies. So, you yeah. know, that's, that's, that's always a, that's always a give and take in, in this situation. So our, uh, our plan on the syndication, we raised an additional 25,000, I believe to, to yeah. put right, it, right away. We're going to put that back into improving the building, improving the building. You know, it's not a huge, it's 12 units. So it's not a huge building. 25,000 will do quite a bit of damage on the common areas and, and update exterior one, exterior lands, exterior balconies. Are yeah. Get so, so our goal Perfect. Is, uh, Perfect. Yep. Yeah. If they see you making repairs, that makes it yeah. a whole lot easier to stomach. It's yeah. particularly yep. visible stuff, you know, paint, yep. landscaping, things of that yeah. nature where they really see that, you know, you want to improve the property. It makes the rent raises much more palatable. Yep. Good. Now, the, on the other side, we look for a value add on the other 12 unit. Um, it's got this beautiful common space in, in it and it's kind of segues into the basement. One of the things that we were looking for to add value to that and the bottom line would we're going to uh, add lockers we're considering adding storage space because there's no storage space so you've got some extra room where you could put in cages yeah. or whatever yep. okay yep. perfect so we're going to put in 12 cages and we were looking at the cost of that i think it was 300 dollars for a five by five cage but we could boost the rent to 40 yep. 40 to 50 dollars a month extra wow so you can do the math it pays for itself wow. in a year yeah that's fantastic it increases the noi by like five or i mean you know these are smaller units but increases the noi by five or five to six thousand a year which now that goes to we bought it for 555 565 we sell it at an eight cap here in the michigan market yeah, in I mean, five it's years it's going to be 750 Eight hundred thousand dollar property Absolutely. Just by that small change alone. Absolutely, so, that's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a great idea. Yeah. So, so what's next for you guys? Before we started that's recording, you mentioned you've got some <laughs> stuff. In, you've got some stuff in the hopper. Yep. What's what what sorts yep. of things are you looking at? So for us, uh, the biggest thing on getting these two 12 units down is is it, uh, we're <laughs> sy we're system. Uh, we like systems in this business. We're really big system guys. So right. those of you um, listening. Every business in the world yes. is two yeah. things, people and systems. Yeah. So if you want to have any scale, if you want to make things happen, like these guys are making them happen, you've got to establish systems. Mm -hmm. So yeah. fantastic. So, yeah. So what was huge for us is, is, is really getting that syndication model down, the system for due diligence, the system for financing. Uh, and we wanted to start small and then scale. So, mm -hmm. so we have a goal just more specifically over the next five years to acquire a hundred million and multifamily assets over the next five years. So we broke it down to 20 million a year. Now we're not in a rush to get there because we don't want to make bad investment right. decisions, right? Right. Um, but I think it's important to set that goal. Sure. Um, so right now, going forward, like David had mentioned, these 12 units were more so training wheels for us um, mm -hmm. to get those systems established, the syndication process, the raising the capital process, the management process. But we found out very quickly, there's a lot of things we did wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Which, such as the five-year term. On right. mortgage. Um, but so going forward, though, we also realize our time and energy could same amount of time and energy could be spent on bigger units with bigger profits, bigger returns. So we made a goal now to look at um, anything 80 units or above. I see. And so a lot how of are you going to take that? How are you going to take that down? Are you going to bring in a sponsor or are you going to are you going to be able to do it yourselves? So that's a good question, Rod. So I have, just from being in the fix and flip business, I have a good amount um, uh, of, I guess, um, what would you call it, uh, financeability okay. um, myself. So I think anything up to, um, like we're looking at a 96 unit now in Michigan, which is about a $4 million acquisition price. That's something that I could take on myself. But going forward, a couple of the other properties we have are much bigger than that. We're looking at a 20 million acquisition, a $50 million acquisition. Those are some of the properties we have in the hopper. And yes, we're, we have sponsors lined up 
um, and, and equity people as well. So what we've also been doing during this process is David's kind of been working on the due diligence, but I've been working on aggressively lining up and having conversations and building relationships with with not only sponsors but also equity participants. Sure, investors. Well sure. Yeah, so that they're okay. they're ready to go when those opportunities come up. So are you going to yeah. do individual syndications for each property, or are you going to do a fund, or how, what's what's your plan for raising equity? Yeah, good question. So we're going to do it on a per property basis. I okay. did, and, and I started in 2016, and I think you probably had this in your notes, Rod. Mm -hmm. um, I raised a fund in 2016. It was a $28 million fund. I raised it in 90 days, and I actually gave all the money back um, because uh, we realized that that model was not what we wanted to do. Um, and in essence, I would become an employee um, in that scenario. And we wanted, our goal with these investments is long-term ownership. So sure. we have plans in place to cash out the uh, the equity investors and keep them for ourselves indefinitely. Um, so, so, oh, so so you're structuring these so you actually cash out your equity? They don't stay in with an equity piece? Co correct, yeah. David oh, interesting. and I want to own these assets uh, for ourselves 100% at the end of the year or at the end wow. of the term, which wow. typically is a five-year term. So, yeah. wow. so that, that's really only achievable if you have, you know, a, a really good value-add deal, as you know. Right. You sure, if you, you've got to buy they, and pull them they, out or... They've got yeah. to have the returns for that for yeah. that to make Absolutely. sense. Where they yeah. where they're really acting more as as uh, lenders. They're really it's really they're acting more as debt than than. I yeah. mean, in a way, I mean, yeah, it is. in a way, in a way, I mean, you could mm -hmm. certainly because the their their return will fluctuate. Their investors, but mine is a little different. My my fund and I'm doing it as a fund, and and it's and it's uh, primarily for mobile home parks and smaller apartment buildings right now. Yeah. But mm -hmm. my game plan is to refinance and get the get the investors their capital back, but they yeah. they they stay in the deal. They stay in um, the deal, deal. right? Yeah. So right. But I, and listen, I love I love your well. I love your mo. I mean, that's a great way to do it. If you can find <laughs> yeah. people to do that, that's a great way yeah. to do it. Yep. So good for you. Well, let's talk about management for a second. Now, you know, I'm a big proponent in self-management and a lot of, and I would say, and there's, there are arguments both ways. If you're, if you're locked into the management, a lot of times that can take away from your acquisition energy. Sure. Um, are you guys planning on, uh, you said you were going to charge a 4% management fee, so I'm assuming you are managing? C correct. Yep. We're going to okay. be managing everything here in-house. Okay. Yep. And you'll be managing the managers, basically. Managing the managers. Absolutely. So on that 24 unit, maybe you take one of the units and somebody gets half off their rent and they're responsible to check on both, both buildings every day, set up so, some systems there to make sure that somebody Correct. is picking up the trash and taking Keep, care of uh, common areas clean, right. pick up the trash. Yeah, absolutely. Correct. Okay. Yep. Fantastic. Yep. Fantastic. And I think one could do both buildings. That, mm -hmm. that you've got to make sure though, just from experience that the other building mm -hmm. doesn't become a stepchild because take it to the house. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it does. Um, so how did you get the financing for those two deals? Did you just go to a local regional bank? That was a good question. So, um, you know, we started off with a referral from the, um, from the seller's agent. And uh, I said, okay, well, let's, let's try that first. And, the, and, and so, but we made a mistake because we didn't have a backup plan. We didn't approach other um, mm -hmm. lenders. So with the first 30 days and our financing contingency went by and the lender kept telling us, yep, they're going to get us good terms, 80, 20 terms, you name it. At the end of the day, when 30 days passed and it got back from approval, um, the terms were horrendous. They were 70% LTV, 15 year amortization. It just killed our, our cash and cash return. Um, so we, we, that was the first mistake we made. So now we know we got to start developing relationships, but also be working multiple lenders on each deal. And, so, and I will caution you on that. You want to be careful, particularly yeah. if you're working with brokers. If you work like with a broker that, that goes to multiple uh, lending facilities, yeah. um, you can get a bad reputation if you've got multiple brokers working at the same time. So it's, it's really kind of a, a you got to be very, very exactly. careful yeah. with that, that, yeah. so that you don't, you don't, bank. Yeah, but if you're direct to bank, then then you're yep. fine. Yeah, yeah. we've gone okay. yeah, direct to bank, and we've also been. I mean, I don't know if it's good or bad, but we've been fully transparent with the banks as well, and told them, "Hey, we made a mistake, but now just so you know, getting involved, working with us, we're working with two other people that are working on the same project as well too." I don't. You can. 
at least on these deals because we we had to catch up ground. We were thirty. Oh days sure, no, okay. So you ball. did that on that on those deals, and I understand yeah. that. I will tell you, if you go into a deal <laughs> saying that, you're not going to be on the top of the stack. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. no. so so I would not recommend that to my to any of you listening. But uh, we, you know, but they have to be responsive, and yeah. and and mm -hmm. there you know, there's a list of questions you need to ask when you get started, and make sure that you're responsive as well, that they get their loan right. package timely and. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so now we've developed relationships with um with with local banks here in particular, uh, banks good. here native to Michigan, and and we've gotten some pretty good relationships established. Including great. The, you the take the, them to lunch. You go yep, have yep. coffee. You do all that. Yeah, I mean, it's That's don't cute. don't underestimate the human component here because really they're people, and yep. and and you don't think of them as institutions. You develop relationships. They see what you're made of. They see what kind of integrity you have, and exactly. those relationships can make you a lot of money. So good for yeah. you. Yeah. So, so let me ask you a question. So speak to the people that are listening that thinking about getting into this business that have not taken action. What would you tell that? What would you tell them? Uh, Dylan, okay. you want to go first? I'll go. I've got a very simple um, mm -hmm. solution for that. So um, the best way to take, I get asked this question all the time because I, I coach people as well too. And, and they're very hesitant, especially people who may be considering leaving their job, right? And they got families and they've got health insurance and they've got benefits. Um, uh, most of the time, like if I were to talk to somebody, I would say, hey, if you've got six, if you're in a position where you got six months saved up, just do it. You got it. The only way to jump in, now this is, this is, I jump, you know, see, I jump. By the way, I'm those of you deep. listening, those of you listening, <laughs> we are actually on video because I'm putting these on YouTube now. And he saw me flinch when he said that. So he got responsive. So I, but I, I'm I got, unique. I, I'm the kind of guy that I just, I jump in, I take the boat out to the deep water and I jump in okay. and I figure it out. So okay, no and I'm gonna hesitation. I'm gonna I'm gonna come right back and say don't do that. Okay, all right. In fact, in fact, to what is today? Uh, today, um, uh, yeah. I've got a uh, anybody that's that's gotten my book is gonna get an email, and the title of the email is how to buy multifamily when you have a full time job. Sure. And the premise yeah. of it is to keep the full-time job, at least <laughs> until you've got some income coming in. But listen, yeah. I want to come back to you with another question, and both of you actually with another question. Yeah. But, but before I do, David, what would you tell him? You know, like anything, you, you just, you have to take that first step. Most people, the biggest thing is taking the first step. They're, they're scared to get into their first, whether if you're going to residential, your, your first wholesale deal, your first right. uh, you know, single family rental, your first fix and flip, even your first multifamily. I would say you learn so much just by doing it. Right. You're really holding yourself back by, by, I mean, I think you should educate yourself beforehand, but some people take it a little too far and they take a year, two, three. I mean, they take too long. You have to jump into it. And, and like you call them seminars. We just had our own seminar. He's been investing for 10 years. We just had our own seminar, just doing these 24 units. And it, you know, it's an awesome learning experience. You just have to, you have to just jump into it and, and, and you, you, you At, just do it. Yeah. Like Nike says, just yeah. do yeah. it. Okay. Do it. Some people I, I, get what we call analysis paralysis and they absolutely. want to figure everything out ahead of time. And that's, that's all I'm saying is yeah. just, you know, at some point you just have to jump in and, and, and you'll figure it out as you go. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. The, and, and, take a look at what I sent out on being able to do this while you have a full-time job, because mm -hmm. You know, I, I really believe in, 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 in full respect. I mean, what you did takes stones and I'm sure. impressed. <laughs> and, and there are people listening that will do that. Yeah. And I will tell you, it's, it's the scary way to do it. But if you're self-motivated and you can make it happen, then fine, go make it happen. But I will also tell you that it's easier to get financing if you've got W-2 income. Sure. It's, yeah. it's, you know, you've, you can save more money if you've got W-2 income. And frankly, you're typically working 40 hours a week and there's a whole lot more than 40 hours in every week. So, oh, yeah. so uh, I, you know, I've, I've interviewed people that have, that have made mega million fortunes on the, so side, on the side, on the side, side doing yep. this business. Mm -hmm. You've got your nine to five and then your five to nine. That's so that's start. right. That's right. And, and your <laughs> yeah. weekends. And, and your weekends. And that's yep. right. So, yeah. you know, I want to ask you guys both a question because you guys really, um, you remind me a lot of myself and getting started early. And I know, I know what motivated me when I was young and it yeah. wasn't just the car. It was, it's, it's deeper than that. So Dylan, mm -hmm. I want you to start. What do you think is your driver? What made you start when you were 13 years old, 14 years old, 15 years old, and really make things happen? What, what do you think it was? You know, that's a good question because when I first started and it's transformed dramatically since, but growing up, I was never a materialistic person. Um, though I had a very specific income goal in mind, um, I didn't have it in mind with 
um, material things. I'm, I'm actually a very frugal person. So I didn't want okay. the fancy cars and the watches and the jewelry and the houses. I wanted to make enough income so that if I wanted to go, I, I like to travel the world when I was really young. Okay. And so if I wanted to travel, I could just travel and not have to worry about anything. Um, so, so up until about 25, so 13 to 25, that was kind of my motivation was to hit that specific income goal so that I had the freedom to travel so that I had the freedom, um, to, um, not have to worry about bills. Um, also I didn't like debt. And so I wanted to ha have a very debt free lifestyle. Um, and so that's why I wanted to hit that income goal is, is, is to have that flexibility to be able to travel the world, experience the world at a young age before I had a family. And then okay. also to be able to live a debt free lifestyle. Um, so that, that's what was important to me at 25 though. Um, my life kind of changed and I actually, now I'm, uh, 30, just turned 30. Oh, you're 30. Okay. I uh, thought yeah, you were still yeah. in your twenties. Okay. I misstated. <laughs> okay. Oh, congratulations. Um, All right. Uh, I had my first child two years ago. Oh, um, so nice. he just turned two in February and uh, you know, that's my biggest why now. Um, sure. You know, you think, you know, love until you have a child. Oh, it's, right. it's, it's, it's unbelievable. So just anytime I think about him, I just, I do anything for him. The, sure. One of the apartment buildings that I'm actually buying, I'm naming after him, <laughs> uh, kind of as a, something that I always wanted to do. So, awesome. Awesome. Uh, but he's, he's my big why now because I want him to grow up and see that anything's possible. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and if you put your mind to it, um, you know, you can achieve it. And, and the best role model for him is going to be myself leading by example. So I would sure. say that that's, that's my biggest uh, motivator right now. Okay. How about you, David? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, I mentioned this actually the first time I met Dylan, we, uh, we talk about goals a lot. I write my goals down every day. And one thing I always write Good for you. Uh, and, and always been a big part of my life is philanthropy. Um, and I know that's huge for you, Rod. We talked right. about it, uh, you know, a little bit on your call. You, you help out with the Tiny Hands Foundation, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have your, you have your, is that your philanthropy? Or philanthropic yes, yeah, no, that's, okay. that's my foundation. Okay, mm -hmm. that's awesome. Yeah, so that's, that's a huge motivator for me. I, I always write down, I want to, I want to run one of the top three biggest philanthropic organizations in the world. That's my goal. I want to be up there with the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Ford, the Ford Foundation. Um, so that's, that's really what drives me every day. Um, along are, with, you giving, are you giving back now? Uh, I do a little bit. Yeah, I do. Okay. I, I, my family and I, we work with uh, uh, organizations around Detroit and, and I do give you know, a little bit um, what I can. I give you know, as much as no, I can. That's, that's fantastic. And the, it ties in, that ties into, you yeah. know, Tony Robbins yeah. says, you know, people, people will uh, achieve to be happy. Mm -hmm. Why not just happily achieve? Yeah, right. And and the same thing applies to philanthropy. I mean, there's there's no reason you can't, you can't give do it back. The whole way, you can't the way, be giving yeah. back right now. It's a journey. Yeah. It's not yeah. a destination. Yeah. So I yeah. just wanted to give. Well, that's awesome, guys. Yeah. That those are both great, great. And and for me, honestly, it was material things. I I, I wanted the I wanted the Lamborghini. I wanted the yeah. you know the Ferrari, the the Corvette, the you know all these things. And 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 I think it was it was. You know, uh, I immigrated when I was six and got picked on at school. And I think it was part yeah. of it, psychological, showing people I'm good enough. You know, I think that was mm -hmm. a mental sure. thing I was going through. But, you know, it's funny. People have different drivers. And, and I always like to ask what the deep driver is. And certainly when you have children, that changes everything. So you said you got a seminar on this deal. What was it? Was it the financing? Is that what the seminar? Or was there anything oh, else? Oh, boy. <laughs> How much time do you have? <laughs> uh, well, no, let's, hear, let's, let's hear it just, you know, because it'll probably add value to the listeners so they don't make sure. the same mistakes. So, yeah. so what happened? Yeah, a little bit of everything. So we went in uh, with, you know, our deal modeled out. Uh, investor splits uh, the syndication model a certain way based on the financing terms being at uh, specific, you know, specific rates, specific oh. amortizations, specific loan to value. And uh, when we didn't hit that, you know, it changed a lot of things. We had to adjust the equity split. Um, we had to reapproach the investors. We had to reapproach the know. investors. We had, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that come into play there. So, yeah. Um, How much I mean, did you raise on that syndication for that deal? 183,000 for that okay, deal. Okay, not bad. How many investors? Yeah. Uh, seven, including myself. Okay, I have, small, did, I have a small piece of it. Did you do a 506B then, the non-accredited? A uh, 506C. C, so accredited, investors. so they're accredited. Oh, okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. How did you find the investors? That's a good question. So um, <laughs> when I, I launched 2016 looking to um, raise a hedge fund, I thought that's the direction I wanted to go with. And okay. I actually soft, help, soft help, taught myself. I didn't know anything about raising capital. Um, I had a fight. I, I didn't have every dollar I've made, I made for myself. I mean, I did it the hard way. Sure. Um, 
So I didn't have any, it was almost embarrassing for me to go and start looking to raise capital. Um, and I had to get over that ego, ego really is what it was, right? Hmm. Um, so I, I self-taught myself. I, I bought the top five books on raising capital. I attended one seminar. Um, the state of Michigan was holding a securities and exchange seminar, an in-depth seminar, which I attended, got to meet with some of the top attorneys in the state. Um, and then so I, I started learning how to raise capital. Um, and I did it through um, uh, what we call, and you're probably familiar with, multifamily, single family offices, institutional investors. And you're, talk, you're talking about family offices. Family offices. Yep. Yep. So it you single, raise it, you raise it from family offices? From family offices and high net Because those are small, those are small, uh, uh, that's a small raise from a family office. Family office. I mean, it's, for those of you that don't know what a family yep. office is, they're, they're uh, you know, typically hundreds of millions of dollars under yeah. management for a particular yeah. family, a celebrity or a great business families, person, yeah. sometimes even billions of dollars. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, so I raised that, I raised the hedge fund from family offices. Oh, in particular. oh, oh, got yeah. it. Okay. So that's how okay. I got started with, with developing those relationships. Oh, I thought we were and talking then, about the 180 grand that, that seemed yeah. way too small for family. <laughs> yeah. Offices. So no, okay. so then when I went to the hundred and, and some of those people in that raise were high net worth individuals, what, sure. mostly sure. doctors, attorneys, things sure. like that. So then when, when I decided to, to not do that and give that money back, we transitioned a lot of those people into, Hey, this is what we're going to do going forward. We're going to do a per, per property syndication model and who's still interested in it. Okay, and great. So, so you'd already done, you'd already done a lot of the work. Okay, exactly. got it. Yeah, yeah, I reached okay. out to a lot of those same people. Now a good amount of them dropped off and said, nah, sure. uh, or family offices are too small. Those guys say, sure. I'm not going to look at anything 3 million or less. Right. 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 So, um, but so the 183,000 was raised. Um, I had a $50,000 chunk in myself and then the remainder was raised through um, doctors, attorneys, other real estate investors. In okay, particular. good, good, Local. good. Good. Okay. Yeah. Any books that you're reading right now that you love? Business related, um, real estate related? I am reading Never Split the Difference. It's by- uh, Oh, that's a FBI. great negotiation it's book. Yeah. Awesome book. <laughs> love Sweet it. Book. So, yeah. Good. Love this book. Uh, I just read, uh, I believe it's called Trump Strategies for Real Estate by George Ross. Uh, it's uh, Trump's attorney and he was the executive vice president of the Trump organization. Um, awesome book on- uh, you know, how to, it, it's mainly taking what he did for his bigger deals and applying them to smaller ones, but there's a lot of good tidbits in there. And, awesome. And bits of information. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and so I'm a big book reader myself. Um, right now though, I'm focused hundred percent. I just started a course um, from Darren Hardy. I don't know if you're reading. Sure. Success Magazine. Yeah. Sure. And uh, he has a, a course, which is um, called Insane Productivity. Um, and it's a 12 week course just on how to really just bunker down and be insanely productive. And so huh. right now I'm fully immersed in, in that and, and a lot of tips and tricks and things to do to eliminate distractions and just maximize Fantastic. productivity on a daily basis. Fantastic. So, yep. Fantastic. Along with your book as well. And of course, oh, your, oh, thank, yeah, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we that showed, awesome. Rod, remember we, we showed right you. Here. Yeah, we oh, that's right. right. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's awesome. That's it, it, it'd be great if right I could get off my butt and get it printed. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, awesome. Actually, we I've been waiting. I've, I've been waiting for some testimonials and they, they just <laughs> came in. So it's about to go on Amazon. So that's nice. exciting. And I'm actually doing coaching as well. So I'm excited about that. I got certified as a high performance coach and, you know, that coupled with all the time with Tony Robbins, I think I can add value there. And of course, do real estate coaching yeah. as well. So, but cool. guys, hey, listen, I really appreciate you being on the show. It's been a lot of fun and uh, you definitely added value and hopefully inspired some of the people that haven't taken action yet to yeah. what's possible. And we are definitely going to stay in touch and follow each other's careers. Well, thank Absolutely. you, Rod. Thanks, and, and more importantly, we appreciate everything you do for the community. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Absolutely. Rod. My pleasure, guys. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Thank you for listening to the Lifetime Cash Flow through Real Estate Investing Podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please subscribe and then take a moment to visit iTunes and leave a five-star rating and review. For more resources to connect with us further, please visit our website at lifetimecashflowpodcast.com. Tune in next week for our next show.